morning. Welcome to St. Paul's United Methodist Church. We are so glad to be in worship together this morning. Uh, it's an exciting day. When we have five Sundays in a month, we combine worship, and it is a little bit different. Um, today is especially so because it's, there seems to be a big game today, right? <laughs> Seems to be a big game. So uh, welcome to our tailgate party. We'll have soup and there'll be plenty for everybody after worship and we'll put the tables out and transform this space. And so I think it... Um, It'll be a really fun time, so we're really glad you're here. Um, and there's room in the front. And I know that's a shock, but if you need are looking for a space, there is room in the front uh, with that. A few announcements I want to share. One, I want to thank you all. Last week, um, we made snack packs for Arrowhead Middle School, which is a school in KCK that Sydney teaches. At, we made 300. 300. 300. So thank you all for that. Um, some upcoming events, uh, I want to keep on your radar, Bishop Wilson's uh, uh, installation is on February 11th in Topeka at 10 a.m., and we have some folks carpooling from here. If you're interested, you can contact the office. Next week, we have two uh, serve opportunities. One is uh, the blood drive, and we have 18 signed up so far. We usually have about 30. They're all usually in the last week of sign, you know, signing up. So get on it if you're a last-minute person, but we'd love for you to donate blood. Um, and we also have First Sunday Food Drive next week. On the first Sunday of the month, we collect um, food and items for the Hub Argentine and for Johnson County Multi-Service Center. And um, some of those items for next week are peanut butter jelly, spaghetti sauce, body wash, shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, vegetable oil, and laundry detergent. So add it to your list right now. Get out your phone and put that on your grocery list so um, that we can uh, bless our neighbors that way. Um, I want to uh, have us give a special welcome to guests we have today. Um, at our tailgate party, we have Tom Brady with us, which is really fun. But you can see Reverend Tom Brady and Nadine, Nadine, we welcome you to be with us today. Tom is our district superintendent. He oversees the, the Kansas City District of the United Methodist Church and um, is a mean cornhole player. So... <laughs> Um, that's real. Uh, we beat the last people we played against. So that's, that's uh, a challenge maybe, but be sure to introduce your, yourself to him um, and, uh, and say hi. And uh, then <clears throat> the elephant in the room, um, I want to make sure that you all saw the announcement that went out this week that I will be leaving St. Paul's at the end of this appointed year. Um, it'll be about mid-June when uh, my time here will be finished. And I know um, there is a lot of shock and a lot of grief in that. And I, I have heard that um, pretty clearly this week. And I appreciate your prayers and your grace in that decision that was mine. Um, Staff Parish and, um, and the, the bishop and cabinet uh, uh, plan to keep me in this role. So I want you to know it was my decision. And um, I think when the spirit is clear, we should listen. Um, and that is not always an easy decision to make, and it doesn't always make sense um, in, in a clear view, but, um, but I think the spirit was clear, and I trust that um, really beautiful things will happen here at St. Paul's, and your next senior pastor will be a gift to this congregation, like you all have been a gift to Carter and I. Um, I just process-wise, um, Staff Parish Relations Committee will meet with Tom today, um, later today, and share kind of what do you all need, and he will take that back to the bishop and the other district superintendents, we call that the cabinet, and they will work to appoint um, who your next person will be. So be in prayers for them, um, and, and uh, for, for Tom, for the bishop, um, and for Carter and I in this transition as we... Um, um, as we all be faithful to, to um, the covenant we have made in the United Methodist Church and the system um, that we are within. And so I just want to thank you, um, and I promise I'm not going anywhere yet, okay? So thank you so much for, for um, 
for your kindness and, and your notes this week as well. So we move into worship. Um, it is our fourth week in a series we have called Lead Like Jesus. We've been uh, focusing on the one we know we can turn to as our leader. And uh, we, uh, we do so today in a, in a worship service where we get to see leaders of all ages. You're going to have introduced to you the lay leadership um, church council for, for this year. So you'll get to put a name with the face of the folks that you have lead uh, this church from the other side of, of the stage here. Um, you're going to get to see the leaders who are our third graders who get their Bibles today and um, get to read all about the leader we have in scripture. Um, we are going to remember our baptisms, um, the, the covenant that we have where God's love for us pours out unconditionally, and we remember that again today. And we do all of that in a time in our congregation where, where there is much grief in this room um, and much surprise, a time in our country where unspeakable tragedy um, and evil happened in Memphis, Tennessee. And we're reeling with that. But today we get to be in a space together with God and with one another to receive the love that we all are gifted with and we all deserve. And so let us go to God um, in worship. Let's stand and sing together.
all sound good. Mm. <laughs> I will invite our lay leadership from church council to make their way forward. What a gift it is that you all get to meet uh, the, the laity who make up our leaders in this congregation. I know that we aren't always in the same room, so what a gift it is to be in the same service together. Um, but I hope that you put some names with some faces of the people who are going to spend hours on behalf of Jesus and this church um, to, to live out the mission to love God and all others unconditionally to seek answers to our questions, and to serve God by serving others. And so we'll invite them to spread out on the stage and to come forward and share. Good morning, St. Paul's. My name is Heather Pineda, and I am chair of church council. My name is Lee Grisenko. My name is Scott Gross, and I am one of your lay delegates to annual conference. My name is Jesse Lip. I use they, them pronouns. I am one of your other lay members to annual conference. My name is Angela Thornton Millard, and I am the third lay member to annual conference. I'm Brian Lee, and I am the chair. I'm the chair. I'm Craig Vermal, I'm chair of the Finance Committee. I'm Lucy Gross, I'm the Financial Secretary. I'm George Geld, I'm the Finance Committee Member for the Department of Law, and I'm the Staff Member. Hi, I'm Amy Rhodes, and I'm Chair of SERP. We're focused on practicing justice and serving our community. I'm Opal Walden. What a gift to us these leaders are. Thank you all for saying yes. I'm excited about what we get to do together in this coming year, and we need God's help. So will you pray with me? All loving God, we thank you that you call us first to yourself and then call us to use our gifts in your mission. Jesus, we need your leadership as a church, and we want to lead like you. And so, Almighty God, pour out your blessings on these servant leaders who have been given ministries in this, your church. Grant them grace to give themselves wholeheartedly in your service. Keep before them the example of Jesus, who did not think first of himself, but instead gave himself for us all. Let them share his ministry that they would enter into his joy. Guide them in their work. Reward their faithfulness with knowledge that through them your purposes are accomplished. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. And together we pray, or we say, <laughs> we rejoice in the leadership before us, and we'll do all that we can to assist and encourage them in the responsibilities to which they have been called. We will pray for them, respect them, and care for them in this work. Thanks be to God for their service. We Amen. Amen. As we continue in worship, I would invite you to worship freely in this space, um, whether that is standing and singing, if that is sitting and being meditative. Um, during this next song, I just want you to know that this is a uh, free, uh, there's freedom in this place to worship this morning.
we sing, you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Let's sing that again. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you.
Jessica Richard, and I'm the pastor of Children and Family Ministries here at St. Paul's, and I am so excited for today. Today is such a special day in the life of the church. It's an important faith milestone, which is that we give our third graders Bibles, a gift to them. And this tradition of receiving a Bible from the church is one that is a lasting memory. Even more importantly, this is the gift of receiving God's word. What's amazing about the Bible is that if you read the same scripture today and tomorrow and a month from now and a year from now, you can hear different things because God speaks to us through the Bible. It's the living word of God. Our Bibles aren't just one book, even though it kind of looks like it. There are actually 66 different books where we hear all these amazing stories and ways God works in the world and God speaks to us through our scriptures. The Bible has songs and stories, stories about celebrations and stories that tell us that we're not alone when days are tough. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119, 105, that the word of God is a lamp that can light up the ground so we know where to go. It's a path for our life. As I read our third graders' names. I'd invite you to come up and you're going to receive your Bible from Pastor Laura. Meredith Glassery. Annalise Cecilia Goff. Madeline Jane Dock. Ollie Harris. Rachel Lucille Maynard. Have our kids lead us in a scripture reading, and so here we go. So um, they are leaders among us today from the very beginning of your journey with, with scripture, okay? If you can go ahead, Rachel. Not, not working. How about I grab Sydney's? Okay, this is awesome. <laughs> I felt the wind on that. That almost hit me in the face. <laughs> Woo! Are you ready, Rachel? Yeah. Okay, you got it. Matthew, chapter 19, verses 13 through 15, says... I'm going to hand that to Ollie. Here you go. You want me to hold it? You got it. Some people gave children, brought children to Jesus so that he would place his hands on them and pray. Okay, Madeline. Here, I'll hold it for you. I'm going to sneak, sneak behind you. Here you go. But the disciples scolded them. Allow the children to come to me, Jesus said. 
So don't forget them because the kingdom of heaven belongs to people like these children. Then he blessed the children and went away from them. And all God's people said, Amen. Congratulations to these third graders. to Kids Connection, because that's what I'm going to announce, or you can head back to your parents for just a minute. I'd like to invite all of our kids to Kids Connection through sixth grade, and today, before I invite us to go to the back, I want to let families know that we'll be coming back because we are remembering our baptisms today, so at the end of the sermon, if your child joins you again, you can don't, don't be too shocked, so <laughs> keep a space for them uh, in, in your row and uh, be ready for them to join you. And so I'd like to invite all of our kids to join me for Kids Connection. We're going to meet our leaders at the back of the sanctuary, and we're going to head downstairs. And I'd like to invite everyone to sing together, Jesus Loves the Little Children, which is adapted each week with words from our welcome statement. on this earth. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Gifts and dignity and worth, you are precious on this earth. Jesus loves the little children of the world.
band and choir. What a gift. Our scripture comes from Luke chapter 22, beginning with the 24th verse. Hear these words. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For God, you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. This series, Lead Like Jesus, has led to some wonderful conversations. We've covered things like the wounded healer and heard a message of what it means to lead authentically in the giftedness to which God has called you. After that message, one of you said it was refreshing to remember that leading didn't have to be trying on someone else's gifts, but moving forward in your own. We heard uh, about Jesus leading as a prophet, the slow change of the truth tellers and justice seekers. I treasured the text after worship I received from one of you that said something happened at your work that week that wasn't okay, and you were motivated to go back to work that week and, and make that known. Last week, we heard about Jesus the leading like a multiplier and how we aren't called to do it all ourselves, but to share the work and extend our reach. I sat here at church yesterday in a leadership retreat with our church council and staff and couldn't help but think about all of the people they will bring alongside of themselves in living out our mission in the year to come. Of course, there were also the wonderful one-liner leadership lessons I gleaned from you all in the greeting line on your way home. My favorite was probably the one that said, just remember, if you're leading and nobody's following, you're just out for a walk. (laughs) Noted. (laughs) Leadership might be a $366 billion global industry. But Jesus and the example and the calling he gives us are truly invaluable. And I won't lie, it's a little bit awkward to preach this sermon on the heels of my announcement that I will no longer be your leader after June. If we weren't already thinking about leadership at church, we are now, right? And it's hard when a leader disappoints us, as I have for many of you this week. And that's okay. (laughs) And that's okay. Your shock and your grief are real. But your care for one another and for me and your resilience and ability to look ahead have revealed your reliance on Jesus as your leader first. And I think that's beautiful. But I don't want today's message to be about me because I think we could all use a Jesus perspective over our own stuff, right? And not just because of my announcement this week, but also because our country is once again reeling after the death of a black man by the hands of police. Tyree Nichols cried out for his mom and leaves us crying out, how long, O Lord? How broken is it all when something as evil as this murder can go down? It is so painful. But this morning, I want to tell you about the Memphis that I know. I spent a summer during divinity school in an urban immersion there, and each day of the week I was assigned a different place to serve and to learn. My church that I got assigned was a mostly white progressive reconciling congregation, (laughs) like who to thunk it, right? But the rest of the time was, was so much more Memphis than that. And one of the best days of the week was our time at Manna House. It was a place of hospitality for folks on the streets open a few days a week for showers, 
and coffee and toiletries and picnic table conversation. Because we served so much that summer in direct service, nonprofit type places, most of our days were spent interacting with the, the same homeless or unhoused folks. I'd be uh, assigned to pour coffee or to manage the line for the showers or to restock the, the clothing shelves so that everyone could get something fresh to wear. But sometimes the job was just to sit and chat because that was how we received the hospitality of Christ as much as how we offered it. And I learned how to do that best from uh, another one of the volunteers, a man named Kirk. He was the first to arrive and he'd set up for, for his work for the day. He was the volunteer barber. And so he'd open his bag and set up shop. And keep in mind, this was June and July in Memphis, Tennessee. So you can imagine that the smell was something fierce. But Kirk made being up close and personal look like it was the best place to be in the whole world. He was funny and, and was a listener, and he helped those folks feel good about themselves. I mean, that's what we all love about our hairstylists, right? Kirk was awesome. You know who else Kirk was? one of the most famous musicians living in Memphis. It was Kirk Whalum. And some of you might not know who he is, but some of you might know. Kirk Whalum is an incredible saxophonist, the one who toured with Whitney Houston and has the solo in I Will Always Love You. At the time, he was the CEO of the foundation that ran Stax Records Museum. Stax, Stax Records is the home of soul music. He is a big, huge deal in Memphis. He's the kind of guy you want to come to your gay love, right? The kind of guy you pay to be in the presence of. And he spends time every week for almost the last 15 years cutting the hair of people who live on the streets. That's the kind of leadership we learn from Jesus today. The kind that puts the powerful um, in, in places of service to others. And to be clear, that means not in places of corruption and violence, not in the places of oppression for the sake of who is ranked over and above one another. Leading like Jesus is leading like a humble servant. To be in power and to choose to do the things that the world doesn't expect of you because you believe the world can be different. That's the leadership we're talking about. It's hard not to, to think about college basketball this time of year. Some of you might remember a couple of years ago um, when Baylor beat Gonzaga uh, in the national championship. The next morning, a picture went viral of Baylor's coach, Scott Drew, loading the team luggage. He exponentially increased his value as a head coach the night before, and let's be real, like secured the ability to make bank, right? And then very next day, he did the job that the least recognized person in the organization usually does. That is servant leadership. And I have to tell you another story about my friend Bruce. I talked about him last week, and, um, and I want to apologize that all these stories are of dudes, but when we're talking about people in power, you know, it's pretty fair to say the usual suspects are dudes. So it makes sense. But they are good stories nonetheless. So my friend Bruce is a bishop in the United Methodist Church. He's retired. And I shared uh, last week that calling him Bruce is a bigger honorific title um, uh, that anything else could, could bring in front of his name. And I shared about his passion of, of bringing people alongside one another in projects so that it wasn't just one person doing it, but that there, were always, um, there was always shared ownership. And go back and listen to last week if you want to hear more about him. But I have to share a, a couple more. Because when I think about someone in the world who could hold power, it's a bishop. When I got told I was going to pastor a bishop, I held my breath, right? But I learned quickly that Bruce was different when I walked down the hall to the bathroom one day, I used it every day at church, right? And he had his arm down the toilet bowl fixing something. I don't know what you fix inside a toilet bowl, but something I don't want to find out about, right? <laughs> and I thought, gosh, he's a different kind of bishop. 
And another memory I have is when I was stuck on a call and I was supposed to be meeting with him and I, I'd seen through the window that he was standing outside waiting for me. And I was feeling pretty bad keeping him waiting. I wrapped up the call, I opened the door and all I could see was my <laughs> administrative assistant outside. And, and I walked out to go, you know, to go find him and what I found was on the other side of that desk. He was on the floor in front of the admin's desk and he was playing with her sick child who she had to bring to work with her that day. And I just stopped and I grabbed my phone and took a picture because I thought um, I was going to be met with impatience or reluctant grace uh, for my tardiness. And instead, he found the most important person there and gave her his full attention. And in his like full body sprawl on the ground, that's my friend Bruce. <laughs> he showed me what it looks like to be led by a child. Bruce Blake shows servant leadership. Our scripture today really spells out why Jesus thinks this way, this kind of way of life matters. You see, we're in Luke's gospel version of what we call the farewell discourse. Jesus knows that he has been betrayed by Judas and that he will die. But we are between those events, the betrayal and death, and they are celebrating the Passover and what we come to know as, as the Lord's Supper, you know, as, as what we celebrate as Holy Communion. And ha they have this wonderfully intimate moment with the bread and, and the wine and Jesus loving them so unconditionally. And then he tells them one of them in this room has betrayed him. Can you imagine? <laughs> Someone in that very place that was supposed to be the best of his supporters hurt him. And then what comes next is what we read today. The disciples start arguing over who is the greatest. They don't comfort their, their friend, their leader. They turn inward and try to be not as bad as the next guy. They try to sort their way toward being better again. But Jesus wasn't having it and instead offers some of the most profound and applicable teaching that I, I have experienced in a while from opening scripture. He tells his friends to stop being like the Gentile kings and the way that they use their power to keep some folks down. Now, they're going to take offense at this. They live in an occupied and oppressed country, so the, ki you know, the kings bring um, automatic dislike. Those kings exercise their power through oppression. They establish power by who is better, who is over another person. What's so interesting is the title that they get, benefactor. At first I thought it was just a weird translation, but it turns out the Greek could, could literally interpret it as doer of good or worker of good. The benefactor is part of what makes the empire work. They would offer favors to, to those with less power and then be expected, um, those people who received it, to offer public praise in return for those that supported them. And the non-elites did benefit from the, the favors, but Jesus is saying, gosh, it can be different than that. For Jesus and his followers, God is the only Lord, the only benefactor to be praised. What's so interesting is that Jesus isn't saying that there will be no leader. He is saying that the kingdom of God is different. So why not start now, right, instead of waiting for that reality to come into being? Why not flip the status quo now into the way it could and should be? Jesus says the leader is to be the one who serves. And then we have this wonderful verse that has him explaining how this works around the table. He says, for who is greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? You're going to say the one that's at the table, but I'm, I am. He's like, yo, me, your leader is the one who serves. Of course, it was custom for those to relax around the table and, and to be served, um, not, not, not to serve. The leaders are usually want the ones in that relaxed posture, seated there. But Jesus had just <laughs> unfolded the Last Supper and both sat around with them and also served them in that place. He says, I am leader and I serve. Things can be different. So the disciples don't opt out of a room having a leader. That's not the calling. They just don't need it to be a benefactor. 
as they know as they know it, right? Who perpetuates oppression and forces hypocrisy for, for, for the good that has not really been that good, right? Because it is really good. It really is a benefit to the world if it is, per, you know, or let's question this. Is it really good? Is it a benefit to the world if it's per- perpetuating a dynamic of oppression? If it keeps going, you know, the, if, if it keeps going those lifelong need for favors, if it keeps saying that the system that reinforces inequality should continue, Jesus says that's not a good thing. And instead gave them bread and wine and said, don't ever convince yourself that things can't be different. God is our only Lord, our only benefactor. So Jesus doesn't eliminate the hierarchy. He's just changing how it works. There will still be powerful ones. There will still be leaders. But the expectation of what we do with that power is to serve instead of to be served. How might January 7th in Memphis, Tennessee been different if Tyree Nichols, uh, for Tyree Nichols, if those leaders those who had been tasked to lead, who held the power in that moment, had believed that the world can be different rather than a hierarchy of who is over and above another. How terribly broken we are for, for a circle you know, of, uh, of black men to take the life of another because that is how normalized brutality has become. Jesus says, I am a leader and I serve. Every step we take in the places we have influence, whether it's our kids' Girl Scout troop or our corporate office to eradicate the sin of white supremacy, we are leading like Jesus. We have to believe that change is possible. How might stress around our finances be different if if, uh, we saw the generosity that God invites us to participate in wasn't a favor to those less fortunate, that we weren't benefactors, but instead uh, we saw it as a requirement of the financial position that we hold? Not, Not as a tax to be a worker of good like those benefactors, but a gateway to the liberation that comes when we see our freedom bound up in one another's. Every time we give of our resources because there is freedom in the sharing and service to the world, we are leading like Jesus. We have to believe that change is possible, that the world can be different. It's why we have a table in the lobby to write postcards to our elected officials to expand can care. Why Medicaid expansion isn't threatening but liberating to us as people of faith. Because in the places that we hold power because of privilege, what a gift we have in Jesus who made sure his friends knew clearly that one day oppressive hierarchy was not going to be the way God's kingdom would end up. Praise God for the invitation to start operating differently today instead of waiting until someone else leads us there. Jesus wants us to know that today change is possible. We see it in our children We see it in our teenagers, in our young adults. He says, if you don't see it, if you don't see it there, at least look at me. He serves and he leads. It can be both. And it can be as simple as a saxophonist barber on the streets or a coach who can make a a trip to the bus with his hands full rather than empty or the bishop who sees the presence of Christ in a child playing on the floor. There is grief in our nation, and there is even more change in our congregation after a handful of years when change has become the norm, and it's okay to be disappointed. And it is okay to be grieved that the world is not yet the different that you hoped it would be. I just also want you to hear the message Jesus has for us today, and it is an invitation into a world that can be different. That is why this faith we have is so compelling, right? That there is a relentless promise that one day it won't all have to work this way. 
Justice can be real, and empathy can be rewarded, and time can prioritize the right way, and people can be valued equally because the world has transformed equitably where grace is undeniable, and God makes all things new. And we don't have to wait for forever. We can be leaders today who live in the way of Jesus, who lead like Jesus. What a gift, what an honor for things to be different. May it be so. In the name of the creator, the redeemer, the sustainer of us all. Amen. One of my favorite things in the whole world is a chance to remember and reaffirm uh, our baptisms. It's okay if you aren't baptized. This grace is for you too. It's okay if you don't remember your baptism. I don't remember mine either. I was a month old at Salina First United Methodist Church. That's okay. But we get to come together and remember the calling we have in Jesus Christ. So siblings in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, God's spirit has been poured out upon water. Water poured over and immersing us. Water that flows freely for all who receive it. Water from the streams of God's saving power and justice. Water that brings hope to all who thirst for righteousness. Water that refreshes life and nurtures growth and offers new birth. Today we come to the waters to renew our commitments in each other's presence. To Christ who has raised us, the spirit who has birthed us, and the creator who is making all things new. And so I ask you, will you turn away from the powers of sin and death? We renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of our sin. Will you let the Spirit use you as prophets to the powers that be? We accept the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Will you proclaim the good news and live as disciples of Jesus Christ, his body on earth? We confess Jesus Christ as our Savior, put our whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as our Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Will you be living witnesses, leaders to the gospel, individually and together, wherever you are and in all that you do? We will remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world. Will you receive and profess that Christian faith is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? We affirm and teach the faith of the whole church as we put our trust in God, the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, and in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Spirit of the Lord is with us. Even so, come Lord Jesus. As I pour out the water, I want you to know, and as I pray, um, I want you to know that uh, some of this water is from the Holy Land. Luke Miltz uh, went there with a class in seminary and brought it back. And so today, the water that we will remember with um, is the same water where Jesus was baptized. And I think that's pretty special. Jesse, will you put that back on the screen again? Thank you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the life you birth in us by your baptism into Jesus Christ will never die. Your justice never fails. Your mercy is everlasting. Your healing river flows. Your spirit blows where you will. We cannot stop you, God. But sometimes we try. We try to block the flow. We redirect the winds of the spirit or we walk so far from the, life, from the life-giving stream that we do not hear its sound and we forget its power. We parch ourselves. 
We are dry and thirsty, O oh God. Come refresh us. Come upon us, Holy Spirit. Come upon us, Holy Spirit. Come upon these waters. Come upon these waters. Let these waters be to us drops of your mercy. Let these waters remind us of your righteousness and justice. Let these waters renew us in renew in us the resurrection power of Jesus. Let these waters make us long for your coming reign. Most holy God, creator, parent, glory to you. Jesus Christ, Savior, Lord, glory to you. Spirit of comfort, spirit of conviction, spirit of peace, glory to you. Eternal God, one in three and three in one. All glory is yours now and forever. Amen. As Josh continues to play, I invite you to come and touch the water. You can make the sign of the cross on your forehead or on your wrist. Uh, remember that you are baptized, that you are loved unconditionally by God. And if you're not baptized yet and want to be, I would love to talk to you about that and what it means. You're also invited to, to give generously. There's an offering plate over here on the table as well. Come to the waters and receive God's love.
Loving God, we come together and we remember this morning that your steadfast love endures forever. In every season, in the hard times, in the joyful times, God, you are faithful. You know what we need this morning. You know what's on our hearts. You know those needs and you provide just what we need, just who we need to do what it is that you've called us to do. We believe that this morning. So God, meet us in our needs. Guide our steps. God, we pray especially for those who are suffering this morning. We pray for those suffering because of injustice and the abuse of power. Pray for those suffering because of violence in our homes and our streets. We ask for your justice and your peace. God, we thank you that as we are claimed by you in the waters of baptism, we are called your own beloved kids. That through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we are rescued. And so you come into the midst of our chaos and, and captivity, and you take us through the waters, and you take us into joy and hope and new life. God, we thank you for servant leaders all around us, like Kirk and all those, Bishop Blake and all who we heard about today. God, make us servant leaders. Show us what we need to let go. Show us what we need to lay down so that we can be with you and your people and find liberation there together. God, we pray especially this morning for Pastor Laura and for Carter. We thank you for their gifts. We thank you for their time with us. We pray that we make the most of these months that we have remaining. God, we pray for St. Paul's and all our leadership, that you continue to lead us in transition. Help us turn to you, God, and turn to one another. Help us to keep growing in every season in loving and seeking and serving, becoming more like you, Jesus. We pray for our whole church. We pray for uh, our elected leaders and our city government and, and those who govern us. We pray for church leaders. We pray for uh, our district superintendent, Tom, and, and for the bishop and cabinet and all the choices uh, decisions before them. We ask, God, that you would fill your church with all of your truth and justice and peace. And as it prays in the Book of Common Prayer, God, where your church is corrupt, purify it. Where it's in error, direct it. Where anything is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where our church is in want, provide for it. Where it's divided, God, heal and reunite us. For the sake of him who went through the waters, who's died and rose again and who lives now to always advocate and intercede for us, teaching us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, please join me in the closing hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, go with us now and always that we might lead like Jesus. Go in peace, eat in joy. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>